Okay. Hi everybody, Colin here. Thank you for joining me. Tonight I am joined again by Ed Mabry. Hi Ed. Hey Colin, how are you? Very well, thank you. Yourself? I am great. Doing good. Awesome. Now Ed joined us on the Do You Really Want to Dissolve Racism video that I'm sure you've all watched. If you haven't, please check it out on the channel. It's a fantastic video and it dissolves racism in under one hour and this is if we can do it if we can do it in under one hour and it's taking people 50 years to do it let's look at where we're, <laughs> how we're living you know so tonight we are going to talk about stories and how storytelling is good now john lenhart and i have already been on talking about stories this is part two because john and i are big picture Ed is small picture and he likes to dissect and really get into the nitty gritty of the subjects that we're talking about. So I'm going to just hand over to Ed just now and he can start us off in storytelling. Okay, great, Colin, thanks. And, and I really appreciate you having me on for this and what you and John have already done because storytelling is, I, I, I love storytelling, I've, I've studied it. I think it's just a fantastic way to communicate because as we talked about during the racism video, stories resonate in the heart of human beings like nothing else. It is the ultimate way for human beings to communicate with each other. And there's a reason be, um, behind that. And you and John gave the, the big picture reason for it. And of course, I'm going to do the small picture analysis of that. So what I like to think of stories, stories are eternal. Yep. Stories are the language of eternity. And when I, what I mean by that is stories are timeless. When you hear your favorite story, watch your favorite movie, your favorite TV show, your favorite song, because songs are stories, yeah. you are no longer in that time domain. You are transported into a, a domain where you, it's timeless, where you're feeling the exact same things you felt the first time you heard the story and listened to the song. And that's what part of being a human being is like, I, because I think we are eternal beings. We are, you know, the, the bodies we in, we, that, that we're in, that we occupy right now, they're gonna fade away. But the real you, the real, and maybe the real Colin Stevenson, is are, is intangible and that's going to last forever yeah and i'll give you an example um of my favorite stories when i was growing up were the star wars movies now when i was a kid growing up i loved star wars i still love it to this day now just to be specific when i'm talking about star wars i'm talking about the original trilogy from the uh, late 70s early 80s and to a lesser degree the prequels in the early 2000s not the current disney stuff which is an absolute abomination that's all market <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do Star Wars. But when I was a kid, Star Wars was my life. And I watched those movies regularly, I, to the point where I almost memorized them. However, every time I watch Star Wars, even though I know what's going to happen, even though I've seen it hundreds of times, I still feel the same things I felt the very first time I watched it. For example, my, my favorite movie in the series is The Empire Strikes Back. Yep. And I will put that on to this day. And even though I've literally seen it a thousand times, Every time I, I put it on, I still feel the same anxiety when the heroes are in trouble. I still feel the same fear when the villains look like they're winning. And I still feel that same triumph when, when the heroes get away. So that story is timeless. Even though I know it back and forth, even though I could, if, if you quiz me right now, I could give you every line of dialogue in that movie. It's still new to me because I am, it's timeless. It's eternal. And I really believe that stories are that language of eternity. And that's why stories resonate with us uh, so, so very well, because again, we are eternal beings. Yep, I love that. So while you're on that subject, I mean, we could go on and talk about that. I mean, that, what you just said there, we could literally take into a thousand pieces and, and go a thousand different directions. But what resonated with me there the most is when you were speaking about the story, we'll never forget a story. We can forget a face, we can forget facts, that John and I spoke about now. When you talk about that story, that reminds you of a good time in your life. It reminds you of being young. It reminds you of being happy. Now, on the other side of it, there's obviously there's a light side and a darker side. On the darker side, when we tell stories of a trauma, of a you know of a, a, a bad traumatic situation in our life, we will relive those feelings as well. Yes, so yes. that means we are living through these, you know, these the cortisol that's been released into our bodies. So we're feeling the pain again. And this is going into the whole complaints thing. So without going into this too far, because obviously we'll go back to you, but what you said there was perfect. And it was the way 
that it brings these feelings back out, you know? And if you didn't watch it for three or four years, because you remember it so well, you can go back and relive your youth through the story. Yeah, you literally can time travel. And you brought up a great point, Colin, because you you were, were, you talked about where I'm going to go with this eventually, but I'll, I'll talk about it right now. And that is that all of our lives, we live stories every day. It's not When I talk about stories, I'm not just talking about movies and TV shows and songs, even though they're great. We live stories, multiple stories every day, because the three parts of the story that you and John talked about in your big picture way, but characters, conflict, resolution. Yep. And we do that all day, every day. So we're living stories. And that's why stories resonate with us so well is because we live them. And, and you talk about uh, facts don't stay with you as long as stories. I was thinking just this morning when I was you know, uh, preparing for, for our talk today about how when I was in 11th grade, I got my, had my first girlfriend, my, my high school sweetheart. And we had our favorite song that, that, you know, that it was our song. And when I was also in 11th grade, 16 years old, I was taking an advanced geometry class. Took it for oh, an nice. entire year. Con, I don't remember anything about advanced geometry. I don't know a hectogram from a decagon from all that stuff, but I could tell you every word of our favorite song because that song was a story. And that's how, that's how we learn and internalize things, not based on facts, but on stories. And we talked about with racism and it's just, it's an amazing thing. And I want to talk a little more about, I want to break it down a little bit more because again, you and John did the big picture characters, um, conflict resolution. I want to break these stories down a little bit more because again, we live hundreds, thousands, billions, maybe trillions of stories. But do you know, Colin, that even though there are trillions of stories out there, you've already heard them. You've yep. heard every single story, not every specific story, but every story theme, because there's only five of them. There are only right, okay. five. Yeah, there are only five story themes. Every satisfying story falls into, falls into one or more of these five categories. I'll just break down for you. The first category, the first story theme or story trope is the hero's journey. Now, in the hero's journey, you have the protagonist. The prota he starts out, he or she starts out in a level of, of obscurity. They discover something about themselves, some type of power they have, some type of ability that they have. And then they get caught up in a greater adventure. And in that adventure, they start to learn more about this ability that they have, and they start to master that ability. And of course, they have an antagonist or a conflict they have to overcome, and they use this ability to overcome that obstacle or antagonist at great cost. And then, but they achieve a goal or a reward, which is oftentimes their true love. Yeah. And then they, then they return back to their life, their old life with this permanent gain. So that's the hero's story. And an example of that is Star Wars. Again, with Luke Skywalker was the hero in the original Star Wars. And he started out in an obscure planet. He learned about the force. He got good at it. And, you know, he eventually triumphed and he got, he got the reward. Um, all superhero movies, which are, you know, popular in the last few years, all superhero movies with one exception I'll talk about later. They're all hero's journeys for obvious reasons. They start out, they don't, they, they gain their power, they get in the adventure, they defeat the bad guy and they get the prize. Yeah. Any, any song or story about overcoming obstacles is a hero's journey. Uh, the next one is called the redemptive arc. Now in the redemptive arc, the protagonist starts out either immoral or having questionable morality, some yep. kind of flawed morality, um, but somebody sees something good in them or they may see something good in themselves, but usually someone else sees something good in them. But through the journey, the, the protagonist gets worse actually, but then through that, but then that good comes out and they actually overcome their obstacle by being moral and then yeah. they remain moral forever. And so redemptive arcs, um, the Christmas story with Ebenezer Scrooge is a good example of a redemptive arc. He starts off as a very materialistic, greedy man, but he gets the, the he gets visited by the three ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. They they redeem him and he becomes a generous character after that. Yeah. Um, most movies that are like romantic dramas or comedies, those are redemptive arcs because the couple gets together. It's usually one person in that erstwhile couple is immoral and they get redeemed by the love of the other person yeah. uh, in, in the movie. Um, so in, in any songs about, um, you know, someone coming to, you know, becoming better, um, that's a, those are redemptive arc. So th those are, that's a redemptive arc. Um, the third is called the journey of discovery. In the journey of discovery, the protagonist starts out not knowing who he or she really is. 
they don't know their uniqueness. Yeah. And throughout the course of that journey, they start to learn about, about who they really are. And they basically gain that knowledge of their uniqueness and they use their uniqueness to overcome the conflict in the story. And, the, and their resolution is that they live in their uniqueness and, and, and they discover who they are and they live like that um, for, the, for the remainder of their lives. And a good example of that is from the Lord of the Rings, you have um, Aragorn. Yeah. Aragorn started off as the, the ranger in the wilderness, but he was really a king. That's who, he, that's who he uniquely was. And throughout the journey of the story, he becomes, he becomes that king and lives as that king. And um, any inspirational movie is always a journey of discovery. So, you know, those, so those are just, any, and again, any song about, um, you know, someone who just finds out who they really are and lives it, that's a journey of discovery. The fourth is the spiritual awakening. Okay. Now, in the spiritual awakening, the protagonist starts out kind of grounded in, in the material world, but they discover a greater intangible world out there. And they gain some type of access to this spiritual power, and they struggle with it for a while, but eventually they overcome the antagonist or the, or the conflict by relying on the spiritual more than the physical. And yeah. one of the hallmarks of those types of stories is that there's always a character telling them to believe or have faith in something greater than themselves. So a good example of that, uh, the Matrix movie. Well, the first movie, yeah. the other two were crap. But the first Matrix movie, <laughs> where, where, where Neo is, you know, he's, he's in this world that, he, that seems physical, and then he discovers there's a greater world, this intangible world, and he has this intangible power. Star Wars, is, again, is another one with, with the Force. Luke Skywalker discovers this intangible, invisible thing called the Force. So we have, so there's a lot of, so that's, that's a, an example, uh, those are examples of um, the spiritual awakenings. The final um, story trope is called the tragedy. Now the tragedy can have any of the other story arcs as, as part of them, but the main characteristic of a tragedy is that in order to overcome the obstacle, the main character, the protagonist, suffers a permanent loss, oftentimes their own life. So that's, that's the tragedy. And um, so any movie where, you know, the hero dies at the end or the hero just suffers a major loss, like uh, uh, Les Miserables is, is a great example of a tragedy. Um, in Lord of the Rings, Frodo's story, Frodo is a tragedy because even though he overcomes his obstacles at the end, he can't live on Middle Earth anymore. He's suffered so much that he has to go off to the afterlife with the elves. So he technically dies. So, and, and Lord of the Rings is a great example of a story where there are multiple arcs. Frodo's is a tragedy. Aragorn is the journey of discovery. And Samwise is actually the hero's journey. Samwise yeah. starts out Frodo's gardener, and then he becomes a hero. And he returns home, um, you know, in his heroic journey. So every story you've ever heard, every satisfying story, has one or more of those. And those resonate in our hearts, Colin, because those are the stories that we all live. Yeah. We all are on our hero's journey where we're overcoming an obstacle. We all have the redemptive arc where we're immoral in some part of our life and someone sees good in us or we discover good in ourselves and we, over, and we overcome it and we get redeemed through it. We're all on a journey to discover our uniqueness. So we're all on that journey of discovery. We all have to eventually realize that there's something greater than us out there. And we need to rely on that as much or more so than our own physical abilities. Yeah. And we all suffer tragedy. We all suffer heartbreak. We all have people you know, who we love pass away, we all, or we have our own infirmities. So all those stories, even though we hear them every single time, even though every movie, every story, every song you've ever heard, these same five things, we never get tired of them because they're what we live. Yeah. I love that, and this is why we can resonate and how we can be, we can be as a, a human race, we can be manipulated by music, by movies, by because it's all stories that they will pull on our heartstrings. So I can relate to Aragon because I am not out running a sword, but what I can relate to is the story of discovery, of him finding out who he really is, and then using that to the better of the lives of other people. That's exactly what you've done, what John's done, and then obviously we're doing it our own way, our unique way, but we're still doing the same thing. And people watching this will understand, they will, you know, they'll be sitting, wanting to come through and speak to you because yeah. a couple of those things triggered me and it actually made me feel really good. So the hero's journey is what I believe I'm on now because I did the journey of discovery before it. You know, I had the tragedy, which wasn't me that lost my life. I lost other people, 
which then caused me to, you know, and that caused me to the act tomorrow. Yep. And then yeah. it caused me to, so I've moved through these, all these journeys that you just told me, I've moved through all of those. And I related to every single one. And I was like, wow, that's absolutely mega. It's absolutely great. So what you just said there was poetry. And literally there's going to be so many people like, oh, I just totally get it. I love that. Thank you. Well, and I can, I can piggyback off what you, you just said, because you just mentioned that your story is multi-layered. You, you have all these different journeys. And so I want to give another example. I, I brought my whiskey this time. I promise nice. my Scott. The last one we were on. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to give you an example of, of, again, going back to my favorite story series, showing how you can have multi-layered stories as a part, excuse me, multi-layered arcs as a part of the same story. And as let's go back to Star Wars. Yep. Now, originally, you had the first three movies. And as far as most of us knew, that's all Star Wars was. But George Lucas, the creator, he actually envisioned Star Wars as six movies, not three. So when he <laughs> went to the studio to try to get the movies done, he said, hey, I have six movies. They said, oh, no, no, that's just too many. We don't even know if one's going to be successful. So how about you do one? And then if they're successful, we'll, we'll do the rest. Yeah. So he, what he did was the most self-contained story, which was the original Star Wars, which is actually episode four, A New Hope. And because it was six, wildly successful, they said, okay, George, do the rest. But so he had to do the, the next two, The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, episodes five and six. And again, as far as we knew, that was Star Wars. But 20 years later, and again, in, in the story of Star Wars, just for those who don't know, it's story, you know, Luke Skywalker starts off in his journey. He's the hero. We have the villain, Darth, Darth Vader, this you know, guy dressed in all black with the deep, raspy voice and that inhuman mask on. And, um, you know, and Luke overcomes him and eventually, you know, they, they in the first um, story, he, you know, they, they get a major battle, a major victory in the battle against the Empire. In the second movie, the Empire Strikes Back. Well, the Empire <laughs> strikes back and they um, have the heroes all to the, all, all on the verge of defeat. But then in Return of the Jedi, Luke comes back and the heroes win over the, Emperor, on the, over the Empire and uh, Vader gets redeemed. And, um, you know, that's a great story. But then we find out 20 years later that the prequels come out and we find out that that character, Darth Vader, who we all hated and feared, actually started off in the very first movie, episode one, as this innocent kid named Anakin Skywalker, who had actually become Luke Skywalker's father. Yeah. But through circumstances, he becomes corrupted within and without by the Emperor Palpatine, and that turns him into Darth Vader. So we get to see a heroic Darth Vader, I mean, a heroic Anakin Skywalker who becomes the villain. And then at the end of the tragedy, he, uh, excuse me, at the end of the second trilogy, he is redeemed by his son. So the big picture um, story arc of Star Wars is a redemptive arc. Yep. The actual story of Star Wars is the redemption of Darth Vader, even though when we first saw it, it was the hero's journey of Luke Skywalker. But both of those arcs are there. You have, the one, you have a hero's journey and you have a redemptive arc all in one major story. So that's how multi-layered these things can be. And that's what our lives are like. We are, uh, you're on a hero's journey now, but along the way, you're going to have discovery. You're going to keep discovering things about yourself. Yep experience tragedies so we experience micro stories every day and just while you're talking about the micro stories you and i had a discussion before this we won't go into air my dirty laundry on air but we went into a story that i obviously explained is something that's going on with me just now now that can be taken different ways so it's also how we read what's happening in our life as well because we read a story, we understand it, but depending on what's going on, we can read it as a tragedy, as a discovery, as the, you know, we can read it in one of these different contexts. And it means it's our choice how we choose to deal with what we're reading. Exactly. That's a great point. And one of the fun things to do, if you, uh, you know, for, for the viewers right now, is to look at some of your favorite stories or even look at some of the movies you're watching right now and try to identify how many different arcs you see within the story. What is the big picture arc of the story? What are each individual characters going through and how does that relate to your life? So what I wanna do for our next step is, yep. I wanna talk about characters in the story because that's, that's also, that's brilliant stuff with the characters because while there are only five story tropes, there are actually hundreds of character types. I mean, yep. you have, the wise old man, you have the, the matriarch, you have the girl next door, you have the knight in shining armor, the henchman, the scoundrel, the, there, there are tons of them. But I just want to focus on three characters 
that we find in almost every story. And the first two are the hero and the villain. Yes. Now, now the hero is, is easy. I mean, that's, that's the protagonist. That's the, the one we're rooting for. The hero is the one who's moral. They fulfill a need. Heroes always fulfill a need. That's what they're fighting for. Yeah. Um, you know, they go on that heroic journey where they learn something about themselves and they, they, they triumph over the evil and they overcome their adversary. And they're the ones we root for them. We love the hero and the hero always wins. Yep. Now the villain, villain's a little more complex and in some ways more interesting than the hero. Yeah. Now, now the main characteristic of the villain is that the villain, he actively, he or she actively opposes the goals of the hero and they pose a tangible threat to the hero. Yep. So that's very important. If you were the, the villain of the story can thwart the hero's plan. They have that ability, the power to thwart the actual plan of the hero. But here's a really cool thing about villains. The best villains don't think they're villains. The best villains think they're heroes. Yeah. And we, and the reason we relate to villains because the best villains are not purely evil in the way we think of it. The best villains aren't just out to destroy things. They aren't, no good villain says, I want to destroy the world. Why would you? We live here. Why would you want to destroy the world? <laughs> or just, I want to cause death and destruction. No, 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 no. That's something else we'll talk about in a minute. The true villains think they're doing good. And they actually have objectively admirable qualities. Think about what a good villain is. Think of a good Bond villain, a good, a good you know, TV villain, a good movie villain, a good story villain. What are the characteristics? They're determined, they're resourceful, they're intelligent, they're strategic thinkers. These, if you objectively look at those attributes, and I just told you, hey, I know a, I know a guy or a girl who is you know, intelligent and strategic and determined and resourceful. He's like, oh, that sounds like a great person. Ah. But they're, the, villain, the thing that separates the hero from the villain is a flawed morality. Yep. And I'm going to give you the ultimate example of our age. Of the last hundred years, who would you say is the ultimate archetype of a villain, of the bad guy? Um, if I was to, oh. It's the last hundred years. The last hundred years? Character as in movie character? No, 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 real life. Real life, the villain, who? the government. <laughs> <laughs> in the big picture, yeah, I, I would say, I would say um, Adolf Hitler. Yep, yep, yep. That's when every everyone's compared to, whenever you think of evil Hitler. Oh yeah, he's another Hitler. But what, whatever, we we he's he's become almost a um a, a, a mnemonic of what a villain is. Yeah. But Adolf Hitler was not a villain in his mind. In his mind, he was the hero. Yeah. He. He, he did not start World War II because he just wanted to see death and destruction per se. He actually thought that his, uh, the Third Reich was the best thing for the world. He actually thought that if the world was run by the Aryans, then everything would be great. So he was, in his mind, he was the hero. Yeah. But he had a obviously very flawed morality. But if you look <laughs> at some of his attributes and take, him out of, take it out of the context of Hitler and say, what was he? he was a great speaker, a great orator. He was inspirational. He was strategic. He was determined. Now, if I were to tell you someone have those characteristics outside of, of the actual character, you'd say, oh, sounds like a you know, pretty good guy. Yeah. But obviously not, because again, he, he had very flawed morality. But in his mind, he was a hero, and every good villain thinks that they're the hero. But every villain always loses in the yeah. end. But another thing to keep in mind about the hero, I mean, excuse me, about the villain, is that because they think that they're good, there's a possibility for redemption. Yeah, I love that. Now, I want to talk about the, about the third character, and then I'm going to bring us into a, I'll give you a, a huge example that I think is going to blow your mind. But there's one more character. This is a character I actually discovered, or well, I personally discovered, as I was watching a movie with my wife. And um, she sometimes wants to indulge in romantic comedy. She just wants to watch those. Me, I hate romantic comedies. They are <laughs> the pain of my existence. I would rather be waterboarded than watch a romantic comedy. But I'm a good husband. So I, I was watching one with my wife. And in order to, not to lose energy, I, just, I used my uniqueness. I started analyzing the different character, the, the story trope and the characters. And the hero and villain were easy. They were the actual couple. One, one person in the couple was a hero, the other was a villain who would need to be redeemed. And, but about halfway through the story, another character popped up. This character was the adversary or the enemy of the female lead. And, she, and this character was, was another woman only lived to break the couple up. She wanted to make sure they didn't get together. That's all she wanted was to destroy them. 
to destroy any happiness they could have had. And she did it through deception, by telling lies and causing other kind of mischief. And I said, who is this character? Not the hero, not the villain. This is something else. This character didn't really have any power. The only power that, that she had was deception. And it was only actualized if they believed her. Once they stopped believing her lies, yeah. then she went away and they got together. So I looked into this character. And this is a character called the trickster. Yeah. So here is the characteristic, here's the attributes of a trickster. Like a villain, a trickster opposes the goal of the hero. However, the trickster does not pose a tangible threat. The, the, the trickster cannot really thwart the villain, I mean, thwart the hero, but they can deceive. The, the, the trickster's only power is deception, and that power is only actualized if the hero and or the villain believe their deception. And once you don't believe their deception, they go away. That's amazing. So, in, 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 so yes, but the trickster's best deception, their most effective deception, is deceiving the hero and sometimes a villain into thinking that the trickster is the villain. Why is that so destructive? Because if you believe that the trickster is the villain, then you're going to ignore the real villain. Yeah. And the real villain will be free to wreak havoc. And if the villain doesn't know they're a villain, they can, they'll wreak havoc, wreak havoc in their own lives, not even knowing what they are. And, and they can't be redeemed because they never know that they're the bad guy or the bad person in the situation. So in, in Star Wars, the trickster is the emperor. Emperor Palpatine is a trickster. All he does is deceive. He has, Darth Vader does all the heavy lifting. The emperor just fools people into thinking whatever they, whatever he wants them to think. And that's how he, he gets uh, his imagination. But all he wants to do is destroy. Tricksters just want to destroy. And once you don't fall for their deception, they go away. Yep. I love that. Now, I just want to touch on something that you just said there that really triggered something within me. The, the villain. We always find the villain and people either love the villain because they might be in that place in their life where they feel the same, but they don't, their conscious brain doesn't quite trigger that that's their behaviours. But what we don't usually see always is what's happened to the villain to cause the poor morality. You know, we always just get them. So they could have been like, going back to Anakin Skywalker being Darth Vader, you go back to these people's life, you don't get to see them how they were pure when they were young. You don't get to see them as a young child and what's triggered this, yeah. you know, and caused their behavior. Because if you look like, if you look at the Joker, for mm -hmm. talking sake, he's a classic villain, okay? Absolutely classic. But later it showed you obviously what's happened with the bullying and, you know, that's caused him to have to put walls up and change his behavior to be able to move on. Now what he thinks he's doing is the right moral thing, but because he's blocked himself off from the love and from the, the self-belief, et cetera, it's caused us to see that, but you don't always see that in films or books. No, that's, that's true. It, 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 it takes a complex writer or complex storyteller to really bring all that out. Yep. Because the Joker has been presented as a villain or a trickster, in, in depending on how the, the storyteller uh, presents him, the person who writes the comic book or the movie. But yeah, he's an interesting character in that sense. Um, and what I want to do, you brought up something really great about not knowing that you're the villain. So I'm going to end, I'm, I have one more thing I want to talk about, but I'm going to wrap everything up by, by um, letting you know how you can know if you are playing the role of the hero or the villain in your own story at any given yes. time. So I'm going to end with that. But I want to give you a huge example of how to, of, of, about identifying um, the hero, villains, and tricksters that I think is, is, is pretty, pretty amazing because it's something that a lot of people get wrong. Yep. And I, want, I just want to give you an example of how you really need to know these character tropes in order to really identify them, not just for when you are hearing and telling stories, but when you're seeing the story of your own life. And I want to use that, I, I want to use that as an example, the most read story in the world in existence, and that is the Bible. The yeah. Bible is the most read book in history. So this portion of the video is for people who either claim they believe in the Bible or people who know people who claim they believe in the Bible. So let's look at the, at the big narrative of the Bible, big picture. Uh, starts off, you know, God creates the universe. He creates man and woman. They're in the Garden of Eden. Then you have uh, the, the serpent, Satan, comes in and he, he, 
he deceives them, he trick, he, he gets them to, to take the forbidden fruit and they eat it and they fall, original sin. And then they keep getting worse and worse and the devil keeps winning and winning and man gets worse and worse. And then finally, uh, God sends his son Jesus down. He lives his life. He dies on the cross. He, he resurrects. And then if you believe him, then you can go to heaven. And if you don't believe him, you know, you don't, it's your choice. And then at, then at the end, you know, there's the big Armageddon scenario where evil is finally punished and yeah. you can go to heaven. So with that story, who would you say is the hero of the biblical narrative? I would personally say it was God. Okay. Good answer, for God. Sending, for sending Jesus down yeah. to do the work. <laughs> okay. And who would you say is the villain? The villain would be the people that ate the fruit. Ah, Colin, you are a very smart man. Because most people would say that the villain is the devil. He's After a trickster. All, yeah, exactly. Because the, he is the trickster. Perfect. The devil is a trickster. Why? Because he. most people would say that he's the villain because he's the evil. He's the big you know, red, scary guy with the pitchfork and the, and the tail and the horns and everything. And he's always causing all this mischief. But unlike a villain, he's not complex. He just wants destruction. He, he can't be redeemed. There's nothing, there's nothing redeemable about him. And he poses no tangible threat to God or to Jesus. They, at the end of the Bible, they, a, a random angel chains him up and throws him in a pit. He's, he's nothing. His only power is deception. Yep. The only power he has is the power over, is, is the power of people to believe in him. So then, in order to figure out who the villain is, then you have to, remember, the, the villain actually poses a tangible threat to the goal of the hero. So if God is the hero, and his goal, the goal of God of Jesus is for everyone to go to heaven, who can stop anyone from going to heaven? Can the devil? No, only the people that listen and then actually do the act. Yep, so the villains of the Bible are human beings. Yes. Human beings are the only entities in the Bible that actually have the ability to thwart the plan of God. Yep. So if you are a, a believer in the Bible, if you're a Christian, if you're, if you're a Bible believer, or if you know someone who claims to be that, ask them or ask yourself, what role are you playing in this big story? You're not the hero. You're not the trickster. You're the villain. You're yep. the one that is opposed, you, but you could be redeemed. And that's, that's why the Bible in the big picture is a redemptive arc. Yep. That's, a, that's the narrative of the is a redemptive arc. And where Jesus is actually a tragedy because he has to die. Yep. But he dies in order to redeem the villain. And the villain is in the biblical sense, in a narrative is us. We're actually the bad guys, but none of us think of ourselves that way. We don't like to think of ourselves as the villain of any story. We're always the hero. But again, if God's the hero, and God wants something, and the only people who can stop it from getting it, because God's all powerful, but He can't. He, he can't make us believe. Yeah. yeah, and again, it's up to us now. Just as you talked about that, there it was amazing. It was just, do you know, I'd never thought about the hero, the villain, and the trickster in the Bible before. And just as you asked me that, there, I literally, I had to think on the spot, which uh, it made me think, which is great. The second thing that it made me think about is, you know, all these people that are causing destruction in the world at the precise moment in time. So through racism, through sexism, through all these things, they believe that they're the hero that are out trying to fight it. But because they're not looking at people in their unique sense, you know, as a human being, they're actually causing the destruction, which means that they are actually the, the villain and the and and everything. So when people come to me, I've explained before that I do energy healing, I do tarot cards and things like that. And people come to me and say, oh, my life's terrible because my ex did this, my ex-partner said this, my friend did this. They blame everybody else. But the only one causing destruction in their life is their own habits. And it's only them that's hurting themselves. So they are the villain in their own life. And when that is presented to them, obviously in a loving, friendly manner, they get to see the truth. And this is where they can redeem themselves to move on. So I absolutely love what you just said there. And they're allowing those circumstances to play the trickster role. Yes. And because they are seeing these, these other attributes as the actual villain in their lives, they ignore the villainy in themselves. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's, sorry to interrupt there. There's so many people that as their, they are their own villain and they just blame. They might, they might blame the trickster, but they also might blame the hero, the person that's trying to help them because they are literally just causing themselves pain. Exactly. So with that in mind, I want to give a, a way to determine whether or not you are the, the hero or the villain, whether or not you're the villain in your, in your story or the hero, because there's a distinct difference. And I actually discovered this uh, when I was reading one of my favorite books. And it's also one of John Linhart's favorite books that we talk about a lot. And that's the, the book Atlas Shrugged. Yep. And, in, and in Atlas Shrugged, there's a protagonist named Dagny Taggart, who actually turns out to be the villain in the book. But she's presented as the hero and you go through the most of the book thinking that she is the hero. However, there's one attribute about her that shows that she's actually a villain. And that is she's always looking for an adversary. And here's why that's important. Remember, a villain thinks that a good villain thinks they're the hero. Yeah. They think they're on a hero's journey. And in on a hero's journey, you have to overcome an obstacle. You have to overcome a an antagonist. But if you're the villain, you know, who is your antagonist? You don't have one. You have to make one up. You have to create an adversary. So people who are always looking for an adversary, looking for a fight, you are proving that you're a villain because you are trying to manufacture your own hero story. A true hero doesn't look for a fight. Heroes respond to a need. Yes. They don't look for fights. In every one of the superhero movies, the superhero is, is he's not looking for a fight. A need be becomes apparent and he or she goes out to meet that need. Heroes yeah. look for needs, villains look for fights. And that's, that, is, that is a mark of a true villain when you're trying to manufacture your story. So ask yourself, are you, are you looking for a fight? Or are you responding to a need? That's why all heroes, by the way, superheroes are always servers in their house like you. Because the servers are responding to needs like a uh, uh, Batman who I actually admit, uh, a Batman is teacher server. Yep. He's, it, and by the way, his story is a tragedy because he's, even though he's a hero, he doesn't go on a hero's journey. He's a tragedy. He's a, his journey is a tragedy because his parents die when he's a young kid and he lives, he gives up any happiness he could ever have in order to, to be Batman. And I forgot to mention him during this, the story tropes. Yeah. But, you know, S Superman is, is, is server server. Spider-Man is compassion server. All these heroes are servers because they're looking for needs. Villains are always looking for a fight. So what's an example of that? I'll use myself as an example of how I can be the villain in my story. My superpower, as it were, is I can see what's wrong and I want to point out what's wrong, teach about what's wrong so I can show you how to be right. Now, if I want to be a villain, then I'm going to intentionally look for people who are wrong so I can jump in uninvited and tell you you're wrong. So Colin, you're saying something and, and I think it's wrong and I will say, no, Colin, you're wrong. And I'm going to teach you and I'm going to make you right. And I, but you didn't ask for that. Yeah. If I'm going to be a hero. I can do it by being in a more passive way by asking you questions. Let's say you say something that I think is wrong. And what I can do is say, hey, Colin, do you think there's a possibility that there's another way to look at what, what you're saying? And if you say, yeah, it might be, then you give me an invitation to come in and teach you and yeah. help, help you write. However, if I'm out there looking for a fight, if I'm looking for people who are wrong so I can jump in and do it against their will, I'm being a villain because I'm not responding to a need. I am putting myself, I'm, I'm taking a step forward as you and John yeah. talked about recently, instead of uh, heroes take a step back. Yeah. Villains go forward and they cause more damage. Like in the racism thing, the people who are trying to you, treating us like robots, trying to uh, give us uh, education and def all these different memes and posting all these stories and saying, stop being a racist, cut it out, racism is wrong. You're being a villain. Yeah. If you want to be a hero, you take a step back like, and, and find out, hey, what's your story? You know, I understand that you don't, you think that this particular race is inferior. Why? You know, what happened? Tell me about you. Yeah. I'll tell you about me and we can learn from each other. That's a, that's a, that's a heroic step backwards as opposed to the step forward, yep. which is what we're all doing on the racism thing and why we're making everything worse. So if you want to know if you're playing the hero or the villain in any particular time in your life, ask yourself, are you looking for a fight or are you responding to a need? Love that. Absolutely love that. That's an absolutely fantastic note to finish on what we just said because most people don't know what character they are in their story because they don't understand their uniqueness. 
Now, John and I and yourself, we post all the time in videos and share things, you know, and we always give them the chance to find out their uniqueness in themselves. And I have given the chance to many people that come to me for, for sessions or even just people that I speak to. I'll say, what's your purpose? And they'll say, oh, I'm a this, uh, you know, and they'll give you some sort of tangible cause, but what's your intangible purpose? In? I don't know. And you offer them the information to go and do it. But because they're scared to find out, because then they actually have to live <laughs> that life, once they know they actually have to live that life, and that becomes slightly scary for people as well. But we can finish off by asking tonight um, to the people, what, who are they? Who, who are they in their story? Are they helping? Are they hindering? Or are they just causing trouble to, you know, to try and manipulate it? I mean, it's very, very easy to see when you ask the right questions. Right. And throughout your day, again, you can, you can live five or six stories in just one day. And in one story, you might be the hero. Maybe you are responding to a need. Or are you thinking about, let's go say your, your spouse says something wrong that you don't like. Are you going to step forward and confront the spouse in a, in a way to prove them wrong? Or are you going to take a step back and ask them a question about it? So you can be, you can be a hero and a villain within, <laughs> within an hour within your own story. So the goal, obviously, is to always be the hero, which means respond to the need take that backward step. Don't go forward. Always go back. Be the hero and don't be the villain. But if you are, if you do find that you are the villain, remember, villains can be redeemed. So yes, of course they can. And again, it's about understanding the villain's story. Yeah. yeah yes. That's the first thing. The more we understand, the more we'll be able to work with what we know. You know, there's a lot of people that don't ask enough questions and then they act out that as being a villain also. So even if they're trying to be the hero, working on an assumption, that's a villain. <laughs> you know, they could have all the good intention, but if they're working on an assumption, they're actually being the villain in the situation because they're not taking the backer step and asking the question to understand the other side. So, I mean, it's great, and I, I can't thank you enough. And you will be back on because, A, we got on great on camera, and I love you. You're just awesome at breaking things down, but also because we've got a lot of other subjects we'd like to talk about as well, and these are just going to keep going and flowing, and yourself, myself, John, um, and I think we've got another couple of people coming on soon as well, so it's going to be great. So thank you so much for your time. <laughs> it's been absolutely magical as usual, and um, you have a lovely time to yourself today, and I will speak to you very soon. Same to you, Colin. Thanks for having me on, and cheers. Thanks, man. Cheers. Bye.